think we are live uh, okay book nerds uh, a very special day again uh, with another awesome author and uh, you know uh, we have with us uh, mr sarpreet singh uh, he's a writer commentator and a podcaster you will notice that in his very professional mic he has got a very professional mic there so you know he is uh, an extremely adept podcaster and we are going to talk about this book it's called the story of the six and uh, i mean uh, i would say a magnum opus because you know uh, i have read some work about uh, the religion and you know the stories about guru nanak and other gurus but this was like this is it you don't need anything else you just have to read this and the wonderful part about the book was that it had the treatment of uh, you know the storytelling treatment it had it felt like it had a plot there was a story going on and of course uh, it has been uh, uh, the author of course uh, has added a lot of hymns uh, which you know add to the book a lot so first of all uh, welcome sir welcome to the facebook live thank you i'm delighted to be here Yeah, great so i was telling uh, peop- uh, all the book lovers who are watching that this book is something which they have to read to get kind of a, you know a uh, holistic and wholesome view of uh, what you have i mean the story of the six and i would say it's more than a story i mean you know you have covered uh, multiple um, uh, things and uh, it's amazing how you have been able to do that uh, i know there's a podcast by the same name which has kind of uh, you know resulted in the book also uh, so uh, tell us a little bit about the inception but before that i want to tell uh, everyone about the previous books that you have written uh, and those are night of the restless spirits and of course the best selling the camel merchant of philadelphia so congratulations on the new one first of all and uh, i i listen to your podcast and i mean it was a no brainer i think so that the book you know should be there and uh, tell us uh, w- uh, why did you come up with the book because of course the podcast format is so popular these days and it has been going on i was like looking and you know there were multiple seasons so um, why the book first of all yeah so the podcast is in its third season now yeah and uh, the book essentially represents the first two seasons of the podcast uh, mm-hmm. uh it really uh, the content is mostly uh, similar to the podcast but certain sections have been enhanced okay uh so really it was my listeners who prompted me yeah. to bring this out in print form Yeah. um you know the podcast was always intended to be a podcast right. uh but then um uh it did um pick up a lot of listeners all around the world yeah. and i started getting you know emails and messages mostly from younger listeners yeah. saying that you know we love the script and we would love to be able to hold a book in our hands and read yeah. it so why don't you publish it yeah. so that was really my inspiration it was uh uh driven by feedback from my listeners yeah um but you have mentioned uh in the beginning of the book of course you have mentioned that you were not so much a believer in i mean you know you you have grown into this i mean and understanding the religion of course and then writing about it is a completely tough job i mean not many can do that but uh, what happened you know uh, of course i have read about it but i want everybody to know that you know what what happened that you have kind of you know gotten on this path sure uh, belief is a complicated thing you know i'm not even sure what kind of a believer i am now but i am certainly a seeker you know that yeah. i can yeah. attest to yeah. uh so yes going back to my own background uh i grew up in sikkim where a sikh was a rarity Right. you know there were literally there was one sick family that was settled in gangtok and then there was another one that uh, uh joined us several years later i think so uh, even now a... i think even now sir it would be the case perhaps no we now, now there are a few sick families okay. and even okay. then there were a few itinerant families uh you know military officers yeah. government servants who would there who would be there for two or three years yeah. but really there wasn't uh any sort of sick community Now 
uh, so for that reason, I grew up uh, not being able to read and write Gurmukhi. Uh, we did speak Punjabi at home. Yeah. So my brother and I uh, learned how to speak the language somewhat organically. Okay. But, you know, my connection to uh, the Sikh faith was, uh, to put it mildly, somewhat tenuous. Okay. Uh, and, you know, in my mid-20s, I went to the U.S. for graduate study. Yeah. And it's really not uncommon for a lot of exiles to start seeking their roots, quote unquote, at some point in time. Yeah. Uh, with me, I suppose that uh, the process started fairly early. And interestingly, it was triggered by somewhat by an Englishman that I encountered in my aunt's house yeah. singing Gurbani. Yeah. So this particular Englishman now goes by the name uh, um, uh, Antion. Uh, at that time, he was known by, as Vikram Singh Khalsa. Right. And in his previous life, he was Vic Briggs, uh, the lead guitarist of the band The Animals, which yeah. I was particularly fond of. Well, I yes. didn't know any of that. I, I mean, I, I, I also know about the band and uh, I was surprised. <laughs> I was like, what? Am I reading this right? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know it. I didn't know it at that time, of course. Uh, okay. You know, it was just a, uh, you know, a sick man in his 40s with his wife and two teenage daughters, clearly enjoying himself as he sang. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't pay much attention. Then I realized that their accents were a little different. Then I looked yeah. closely and realized that they looked white. And, right. you know, I remember somewhat curiously approaching him after yeah. the event and asking. And honestly, I don't even remember, you know, what we talked about. Yeah. But I was taken by the fact that... Uh, somebody who had been born into a totally different culture yeah. had crossed the barriers of language and faith, of course, mm -hmm. and had embraced this faith, which I had inherited. Yeah. And he derived so much joy out of it. It was really evident. While I, you know, in contrast, looked upon my identity as a bit of a burden, to be very honest, yeah. you know, because as much as a Sikh wa uh, was a rarity in gang talk, it was very similar in Westchester County, where I was in grad school. Okay. And for a host of reasons, I was not very comfortable in my skin. Right. So that was really the start of my journey. So and when this I is came which state, back to... Uh, yeah, which state Bingham. is this? Uh, Westchester is which New state? York City, okay. uh, close to north of New York City, New okay. York State. Okay. So when I got back to my university from visiting my aunt, I went to my library um, and uh, you know sought out books. There weren't that many. Hmm. I found this uh, history of the six written by J.D. Cunningham. Yeah. who used to be a servant in the East India Company and had been stationed at Ludhiana yeah. uh, in the mid 1800s, which was okay. kind of the westernmost outpost of the East India Company. Yeah. So Cunningham had the opportunity to study the six. He developed a great admiration for the six, yeah. so much so that he dared to consider them the equals of the British, you know, <laughs> which earned him... Uh, notoriety and he was essentially kicked out of service and died a pauper. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was quite an interesting story. Uh, yeah. But I remember reading Cunningham's account yeah. and I remember being fascinated by the stories that he had written about the lives of the gurus, about the struggles of the Sikhs in the 18th century after the passing of Guru Gobind Singh, yeah. uh, you know, as the uh, Mughal Empire was crumbling under first the onslaught of <clears throat> Nadir Shah from Persia, and then the successive invasions of Ahmad Shah Durrani, which kind of decimated Northern India, Punjab was in a turmoil. And, you know, Mughal uh, control over Punjab had pretty much uh, disappeared. And the six had slowly started flexing their muscle, which brought them tremendous repression from the Afghans, from the Mughals. So these stories really fired my imagination and that was the start of my journey. Yeah. So I went on to read uh, Max Arthur McAuliffe's opus, The Sikh Re Religion, which was yeah. initially published in six, six volumes and is now available in three. Okay. So McAuliffe, 
had studied uh, the Sikh scripture, the Guru Granth Sahib, deeply mm -hmm. uh, under the guidance of Pai Khan Singh Nabba, who was one of the leading Sikh intellectuals of his time. Mm -hmm. And he had written a very traditional account of uh, the Sikh Gurus, yeah. which I really enjoyed reading. And then I went on to read um, uh, the history of the Sikhs written by Krishwant Singh, mm -hmm. uh, which was probably written, I'm guessing, about 70, 80 years ago. Mm -hmm. Also, very, very well done. So that was kind of my first foray into Sikh history. Now, as the years passed and I started getting involved with the Gurdwaras, first in New Jersey and then in Massachusetts, yeah. uh, I started teaching. So I have a abiding passion for uh, Sikh sacred music or Gurmit Sangeet. Yeah. So I had taught myself that and then I started teaching that and I also started teaching Sikh history. Yeah. And, you know, um, history can be a very dry subject. And, you know, I say this with a <laughs> smile because uh, as much as I love history, sometimes the books that you encounter are hard to read. True. And it's very easy, right? Yeah. And it's very easy to put, you know, 10-year-olds and 12-year-olds to sleep when you're teaching history. <laughs> So that's when I experimented with a few things. I actually wrote a couple of simple plays in Punjabi yeah. and had the children act in them. And, you know, they really enjoyed it. And they're all grown up now. Yeah. But I can tell you that the pieces of history that they learned from the plays, yeah. they are never going to forget. So yeah. that's when I sort of uh, serendipitously discovered that the intersection of storytelling and history could be very, very interesting. Uh, so as the years passed, uh, I taught myself Gurmukhi, of course, so that I could read the Guru Granth Sahib. And I started reading works written in Punjabi as well, notably the writings of the Sikh mystic and savant uh, by Veer Singh, yeah. who has written beautifully about the Sikh gurus and about Sikh history. And then from there on, I moved on to a lot of uh, poetry, some written in the 1700s, some written in the 1800s, mostly in Braj Bhasha. Yeah. And, you know, this was poetry by the likes of, <coughs> excuse me, yeah. uh, Kavi Santok Singh. Uh, if you see my background, the collection of blue volumes that you see are, yeah. uh, you know, Kavi Santok Singh, Suresh Pratap Granth. Yeah. Uh, I also encountered the so-called Gurbilas literature, which yeah. is uh, a historic, uh, a, a epic uh, retelling of the lives of some of the gurus, uh, right. um, emphasizing their heroic deeds. Yeah. The Gurbilas Pachai Chevi about Guru Hargobind, the Gurbilas Pachai Dasvi about Guru yeah. Gobind Singh, and then uh, one of the most important works written in the time of Guru Gobind Singh, the Sri Guru Soba of Senapati. So, you know, uh, if you'll humor a small digression, uh, in the modern world, we have dichotomized the Sikh gurus, where we see Guru Nanak as this white bearded holy man, his hand yeah. raised in benediction, yeah. and we see Guru Gobind Singh as a young warrior. Yes. And of course, you know, those are legitimate aspects of their personalities, yeah. but they hide the fact that Guru Nanak was as militant as Guru Gobind Singh. And I'll explain why later on in the conversation. Yeah. And Guru Gobind Singh was as spiritual as Guru Nanak yeah. and as much a lover and composer of poetry. Yeah. So in Guru Gobind Singh's court were the celebrated 52 poets, and one of them was Chandrasen or Senapati. Yeah. So he wrote the first biography of Guru Gobind Singh in Braj Pasha called Sri Guru Soba. Yeah. So these works inform the story of the Sikhs podcast and the book significantly. Yeah. And as you observed at the start of the conversation, in addition to presenting the history from a storyteller's perspective to make it engaging, mm -hmm. my other intention was to introduce some of these texts, some sacred, some secular, mm -hmm. to a new generation which left to itself was never going to touch them. Right. So it's my fond hope that inspired by the excerpts and the translations in the book, some young people at least are going to read them in the original because yeah. honestly, that's the only way to read them. Yeah. So that's kind of the genesis of the yeah. work. 
and uh, you're so right i mean it's um, kind of everything has been put together in um, i don't know if i should uh, use the word but it's entertaining i mean i was looking forward to you know and that's something which uh, many history books kind of you know uh, are not so i mean yeah uh, i really wanted to talk about the inception of uh, guru nanak and on page 8 uh, in the beginning of the book itself there's a part where you know uh, his father uh, tells him to you know get to work because he wasn't doing anything in his eyes at least i mean he was just yeah he was he was just doing his thing and uh, it's uh, you've written that um, so he sent away uh, to you know kind of uh, start his traders you know uh, business and become a trader and it's written that after they had walked for a bit uh, they came upon a forest which was home to a gaggle of holy men uh, of every imaginable stripe nanak paused uh, taking in the wondrous scene his eyes sh- shining some of the holy men were seated silently and calmly eyes shut in deep meditation some were performing austerities uh, twisting their bodies in complicated uh, postures or standing upright with their arms stretched to the heavens others sat warming their hands around smoking mounds of twigs and leaves and some sat in the lotus position a solitary man sat naked in a small pool of water and it goes on and this is where you know kind of the uh, you know inception of everything that has happened over history i mean 1469 to even now i mean it's 1708 but you know it's even now even now it's going on so tell us about the inception um and it was very interesting there were some fantastical elements in it which you have sometimes you know <laughs> Uh, laughed at yourself but i don't know what was happening but uh, in the beginning tell us more about that sure so uh, nanak the boy was precocious you know he was clearly not like other children yeah. and you know there are a host of stories that swirl around him how many of those are apocryphal we are never going to know yeah. and i do talk about that in the book as well you know particularly after the episode where he squeezes the rich man's rich bread and oh, yeah. out drips blood and he yeah. squeezes the poor man's yeah. millet roti and out drips the milk of milk. honest labor yeah. Yeah. you know the point is that some of these stories might be apocryphal but i definitely don't dismiss them because yeah. each of them tells a very important story yeah. now right from when gurunanak was a child when you know his first teacher the local village brahman you know saw him compose an acrostic and you know saw him speak about deep philosophical matters he yeah. immediately realized that he's no ordinary child yeah. and then when gurunanak was to have his uh, you know initiation ceremony when he was going to be uh brought into the ranks of the twice born with his janu yeah. you know this 9 year old boy boldly confronts the brahman and says that you know is this thread uh, indestructible will it ever get dirty will it can it be burned by fire yeah. and when the brahman somewhat irritated says you know what sort of nonsense are you spouting how can the thread be indestructible and how can it never get dirty and then gurnala goes on to ask can my sister get one and the answer was of course she couldn't so you know the conversation that gurunanak had with uh, the priest is recorded in the guru granth sahib so it appears in the asadivar one of the ballads in the guru granth sahib and it's recounted here so all of these stories tell us about this deeply spiritual boy uh who was very much inspired by the divine but also unlike a lot of other holy men of the time was not divorced divorced from the world yeah. he was of the world he was a keen observer he could see things going around him that he could not stomach and yeah. could not subscribe to, uh, to. Uh, he was certainly not the first thinker from the indian subcontinent to yeah. 
essentially declared that caste-based discrimination was wrong. He was not the first. Kabir, who preceded him, had similar things to say. Bhagat Namdev and several other Bhagats had similar things to say. The genius of Guru Nanak, however, was that he didn't stop at just condemning these practices. He actually created institutions that were designed to drive a stake through the heart of discrimination. So all of this we find being developed as we engage with these stories. You know, social justice was tremendously important to him. Economic justice was tremendously important to him. In a land of plenty where rich landowners exploited the poor, it was unacceptable to him that some people go hungry. Hence the genesis of the community kitchen or the langar, which is what the story that you pointed to talks about that when Guru Nanak was given capital to start business, he used that to feed a bunch of hungry sadhus. And of course his father got very upset yeah. And out of that failure as a, tra- uh, as a trader yeah. rose this mighty institution, the Guru Ka Langar, yeah. which 550 years later continues to f- feed the hungry all over India. And, you know, yeah. if the whole world knows anything about Sikhs, they know about the Guru Ka Langar yeah. and the brilliance of the Langar where everybody had to sit side by side and eat with no, uh, you know, knowledge of whether you were sitting to a low ca- next to a low caste person or a high caste person, yeah. this was the brilliance of Guru Nanak, yeah. and this is what we start to see emerge yeah. as he travels, as he debunks superstition, as you know, he teaches this bandit who used to prey on innocent pilgrims yeah. that doing that is wrong, and lo and behold. That's the birth of the first Gurdwara. Yes. So, you know, these are the things that we encounter in Guru Nanak's life, which become the bedrock of the religion that he's in the process of founding. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, I was surprised uh, by how, you know, um, uh, you have written about the Mughals also in the book. And there were several times in history, and this was... Uh, a, a very pleasant surprise that you have woven this into the entire, uh, I can, uh, may I call it the plot. And because uh, there were several times, like uh, there were meetings with Babur, Akbar, and over the over the period of time, uh, of course, with Jahangir and Aurangzeb, they, these were all, play, these all Mughals, the emperors were, you know, involved in the, uh, the growth of the religion. Uh, if we can uh, call it that. And, you know, several times there were confrontation also. Indeed, indeed. I was going to say they were involved in the growth either by intent and sometimes <laughs> by accident. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> because, you know, they pushed the community by doing certain things which yeah. made it more resilient and yeah. strengthened its principles. But yes, yes, indeed. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I... right, right from uh, the time when Babur was not even the emperor, yeah. To Aurangzeb and beyond, I mean, you know, season three of the podcast covers the time of Bahadur Shah and then okay. Farooq Siyar and then Muhammad Shah Rangile yeah. and all the other Mughal emperors who followed yeah. and sort of, you know, this push and pull just continued yeah. as long as the Mughal empire existed. Yeah. And I mean, there were several uh, examples in the book where, you know, you, you're like, you know, uh, this is going to result in war and eventually didn't happen in battle but of course later on in uh, uh, it happens eventually but uh, uh, how do you think uh, the community you know kind of dealt with this entire Mughal empire who was you know towering every uh, over everything else but these were people who were just spiritual and kind of you know doing their own thing but they were kind of you know um, there was interference at many times Yes, indeed. And, you know, uh, it's important to acknowledge that the community, starting from the gurus, were never just spiritual. Right. They were always spiritual, but they were always very connected to the world. Yeah. You know, we think of Guru Gobind Singh. When we think about Guru Gobind Singh, we think about his battle with uh, Aurangzeb yeah. and... Uh, 
Vazir Khan, uh, the Fajdar of Sarand, who bricked his young sons alive. Yeah. We think about the battle at Chimkor, where his older sons perished. Yeah. We think about his confrontations with the so-called Hill Rajas, yeah. the kings of the uh, kingdoms that encircled Anandpur Sahib. Yeah. And we kind of focus on his commitment to fighting oppression. Yeah. Well, this commitment to fighting oppression was not an original construct or concept of Guru Gobind Singh's. Yeah. It came right from Guru Nanak. Yeah. You know, I would boldly say that when Guru Nanak was in Sayyidpur and he saw the terrible massacre that Babur had perpetrated, yeah. and he boldly confronted Babur, called him a tyrant to his face, yeah and cried out in anguish. His cry of anguish against oppression for me is no different from the Kirpan of Guru Gobind Singh when he created the Khalsa. Yeah. So there's an unbroken thread yeah. that goes from the mouth of Guru Nanak to the sword of Guru Gobind Singh yeah. and touches every guru in between. Yeah. Yeah. And to bring it back to the question that you answered, so yeah. yes, you know, the community was spiritual. Its yeah. concerns were with the divine, but their concerns were also with society. Yeah. They cared about the fact that the poor were being exploited, that women were being discriminated against, that, you know, women were being burned on their husband's funeral pyres. Yeah. Yeah. These, are, these were injustices that the gurus tried to put a stop to. Right. So in that sense, sense they were always very connected to the society and politics of their times of course things came to a head at the time of the fifth guru yeah. when he was tortured and killed at the order of the mughal emperor jahangir right. and then you know i use the words of the poet santok singh to talk about guru arjan when he's about to pass He's on the banks of the river Ravi. He's about to give up his body. Yeah. And then he tells his followers, go to my son, who was the lad at that time, who's the yeah. next guru, yeah. and tell him to put on a sword yeah. because the time to confront tyranny directly is now upon us. True. So to me, it was no deviation from what Guru Nanak had said. It was just a different phase in the struggle. And yeah. that's when an army was first raised. And that's yeah. when the first battles against the Mughals were fought. Yeah. Now, what did the common people think about it? Well, the common six were willing to give up their lives on, you know, one sign from the gurus. So yeah. they responded. They responded with sons, they responded with wealth, they responded with weapons. Yeah. And every time the gurus put out a call, the Sikhs were there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, it, it was quite a change in the narrative for me. I mean, I was just reading this like a novel, you know, I mean, there was a progression and, you know, um, of course, there were multiple gurus and it was so interesting that this, you know, uh, change happened. Uh, although quite subtle because the basics were always there. Uh, also, I wanted to talk about page 100 and uh, we talk about uh, women and of course there are um, uh, these hymns and poetry uh, in between which I mean you would be able to recite <laughs> much better than me so I won't even give it a try. And uh, so uh, can you recite something? And then I wanted to go about sure. the uh, the sixth view and of course uh, about women and how, you know, um, this was one of the things that uh, Guru Nanak, of course, wanted to, you know, kind of get rid of and uh, of quite, uh, yeah, did well at that. Yeah. So I'll read a short excerpt and then the translation, then I'll talk about it. Yeah, sure. पांड जमिए पांड निमिए पांड मंगन व्याहो पंडो होवे दोस्ती पंडे चले राहो पांड मुआ पांड पालिए पांड होवे पंधान सो क्यों मंदा आखिए जित जमे राजान पंडो ही पांड उपजे पंडे बाज न कोए नानक पंडे बाहरा एका सच्चा सोहे सो दिस रिफर्स वेरी डायरेक्टली टू द पोजीशन दैट वुमेन 
enjoyed within quotes in society at that time. Mm -hmm. So the women were the lowest of the low and, you know, the worth of a woman in the rigid caste hierarchy was the same as the worth of a Shudra. You know, that was the stark reality of that time. And Guru Nanak says, from a woman born in a woman formed, a woman you wed to seek, a woman your true companion, does she not your line bespeak? Mm -hmm. Passes when she another you seek, to a woman are you not bound? How dare you then to deem her low, birth she every monarch crowned, from a woman each is each woman born without her will not life accrue unborn of woman nanak says the only one is my lord true so gurnanak is saying women are the cause of all birth yeah. So how can you call a woman low? He's asking a rhetorical question, right? Because yeah. it yeah. makes absolutely no sense. True. And then true to uh, form, the gurus were not content with just offering hymns. Yeah. You know, the gurus, uh, when, uh, t- when time came for them to organize the faith, yeah. uh, when uh, ministers were appointed to go to far-flung fun- places to yeah. tend to sick congregations, some of them were women. Yeah. And, you know, the practice of sati was uh, banned by uh, Guru Amardas. Yeah. Uh, female infanticide was unfortunately something that was practiced. Yeah. And to this day, You know, even though female infanticide may not be a huge problem, but female feticide certainly is. You know, we know about sex selective abortions and and so on. Well, in the Sikh Code of Conduct, which was formulated in the early 20th century and derived from the thoughts of the gurus, female infanticide is expressly forbidden. So... In that sense, the gurus were progressive. They were 500 years ahead of their time. And they essentially unequivocally said that just like caste discrimination is not okay, gender-based discrimination is not okay. But I'll also add that, you know, I don't say this to be self-congratulatory as a Sikh by any means, because, you know, the, th- the ideas of Guru Nanak are 550 years old. Our patriarchy and the baggage that comes with it is thousands of years old. Mm-hmm. So it would be an oversimplification to say that the Sikhs have rid themselves of gender-based discrimination yeah. because clearly we have not. We still see uh, you know, more men in positions of prominence within in the context of the faith. But yeah. I will tell you this that there is tremendous awareness within the Sikh faith and there's always a struggle and a fight. And the newer generations in particular are very, very sensitized to that. You know, at a very personal level, you know, my daughter who's in her uh, twenties recently performed the Anand Karaj or the marriage ceremony of two of her friends, which is absolutely permissible in Sikhism because, you know, you're reading from the scripture. There is no ordained clergy. Anybody can read, but it's not commonplace. Uh, But, you know, every Sikh knows, you know, just like Sikhs are forbidden uh, certain things, they know that gender discrimination is not okay. Right. So even though the implementation is imperfect, there is a lot of awareness. And, you know, I'm certainly very, very optimistic. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in uh, chapter eight, the blessing, I mean, we read about uh, the formation of uh, and, you know, establishment of Harmandar Sahib. And, you know, it's it's a, I mean, it's a huge event. I mean, that has happened a huge uh, Maki event that has happened and Guru Arjun has been at the you know forefront of all of it. Uh, how do you see that? I mean, because it, of course, after that for years, you know, uh, as you have mentioned in the book also, the Golden Temple was, you know, targeted multiple times uh, by governments and, you know, monarchs, it, uh, the works. 
but how do you see it like what is the significance of that event sure sure so it was obviously very significant for a number of reasons first of all it was the harumandar sahib yeah. it was a temple dedicated to god yeah. and not a deity that was yeah. tremendously important yeah. the second thing was that the temple had four doors which signified that all the four castes were always welcome at this temple yeah. another thing that was significant was that it was built at a level which was lower than the surrounding ground right. which signified humility yeah. so these were tremendously important constructs in sikhism that were in a certain sense enshrined in the golden temple right Now Sikhism is not a faith that subscribes to pilgrimages in fact Guru Nanak himself condemned all forms of superstition right. we find similar thoughts in Guru Gobind Singh's writings as well that said the golden temple over time very much became the visible heart of the faith yeah. particularly in the 18th century when Sikhs were subjected to terrible repression yeah. attacking the golden temple desecrating it turning it into a place where horses were tied on the sides and courtesans were invited to dance inside for the entertainment of the governor okay. these were things that were done repeatedly to humble and humiliate the sikhs mm -hmm. but the sikhs always responded by building back the temple more glorious than it had ever been so yeah. in a certain sense you know the 18th century onwards not only was it a important visible symbol yeah. it essentially became an embodiment of the resilience that the faith showed right. you know after the first great holocaust uh, the chota ka lukara the yeah. small holocaust and the large holocaust which is not in this book that's going yeah. to be in the next volume okay. uh, every time the sikhs would kind of go back to amritsar to the golden temple important yeah. decisions would be made there and it continued to be the heart of the faith as it is today yeah. so so it was a hugely important step and in my mind mm -hmm. it was one of the three great institutions that guru arjan sahib created in his lifetime yeah uh yeah and uh, it is uh, you know I, i i was particularly you know um uh, i loved the way the issue of nepotism i mean because you know in the beginning of course there was no nepotism i mean there was guru nanak guru angad uh guru amar das and somewhere in between this you know uh, due to a prophecy uh, this uh, succession comes in and uh, you know i mean it's kind of uh, i don't know what word should i use for it it was kind of confusing for me because mm -hmm. you know uh, the teachings the initial teachings were you know that we should be like against nepotism but why i mean of course there is an explanation given but it is quite you know i was you know i didn't get it as such so i wanted to ask you so it will always remain a metaphysical mystery really and you know the quote from harinder singh mahboob that i quote yeah. at the end of that chapter kind of summarizes my feelings yeah. but it's important to note that the actions of guru nanak were not so much quote unquote against nepotism okay they were more along the lines of picking the most capable person for the job okay that was the important thing okay. and of course you know it created great drama within his family and his oh, yes. successor's family and his successor's family why because sons always feel that they deserve to it, like I have to be <laughs> what belong to their fathers oh, yes. but it oh, didn't yeah. happen that way for the first four gurus yeah. and then things changed why did they change unfortunately we will never know yeah. you know i don't have a neatly packaged answer for that true uh you know the notion that uh, guru amar das's daughter coveted that the guruship remain in her family i can't reconcile to given what i've read about her given what i've learned of her personality and so on yeah. uh, you know as a sikh 
Yes. The answer that I would give is that the gurus were human beings. They mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. made it a point to assert that they were not God. They were human beings, yes. but they were very different human beings from you and I. Right. You know, by virtue of their connection with the divine, by virtue of their spiritual state, yeah. they saw things that I certainly don't see. Yeah. So as a Sikh, I am very content and I truly believe yeah. that every guru made the right decision on succession yeah. when it was time for that decision to be made. Yeah. Why? How? Who knows? Who yeah. knows? It will always remain a mystery. Right. And you have mentioned... And, you know, I would, I would urge my readers to read the Harinder Singh Mahboob's quote at the end of that chapter. Sorry, I interrupted you. Of course, you. of course. No worries. And you have talked about uh, Gurmat Sangeet and, you know, your, you have kind of, you know, uh, taken it forward. And uh, it is based on the ragas, right? And you have mentioned uh, in a it chapter is. that it is, uh, it is based on the ragas. Um, why, uh, why wasn't it important to, uh, you know, include the ragas and kind of, you know, uh, do it that way? Um, so that's a complicated question. Okay. Uh, you know, um, a lot, most of the, of the writings in the Guru Granth Sahib are prescribed to particular rags and why they were chosen, you know, we can speculate endlessly upon them. Yeah. The fact of the matter is that the music of the Indian subcontinent is ancient. Right. Its roots are in spiritual practice. Yeah. It has always been wedded to spiritual practice. Yeah. In the world of Gurmat Sangeet, the rag is very much a vessel. So the main thing being served is the writing, the thought, the abstraction. Yeah. The melody and the rag is a beautiful vessel in which the abstraction is presented. Right. Why is it important? Yeah. It evokes emotions. It okay. makes the listener receptive. Yeah. So, you know, I read something written by Pai Veer Singh, who I talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've cited that in this book. Yeah. But Pai Veer Singh essentially says that the heart of Gurmat Sangeet or Sikh yeah. sacred music are the seminal tunes and melodies that have been passed down, you know, from teacher to student in an oral tradition, right from the times yeah. of the gurus themselves. Yeah. These mystical melodies are really what were created by them and the early masters of Sikh sacred music. Yeah. And in a certain sense, they help convey the essence of the mystical poetry. Yeah. I mean, as somebody who enjoys uh, music tremendously beyond the bounds of Gurmit Sangeet, I can yeah. tell you that the emotional impact of the rag-based music yeah. is something that has to be experienced. It mm -hmm. simply cannot be articulated yeah. because even Gurbani singing comes in many different flavors. Right. You know, there are many quote unquote popular styles yeah. where the singers sometimes borrow from Bollywood, yeah. sometimes they borrow from popular guzzle tunes. Yeah. And, you know, those are fine. You know, people are still enjoying the music, enjoying the poetry. Yeah. But I can tell you that when you compare that rendering with that of Shabad's rendered in drugs, yeah. they end up sounding banal. They end up sounding bereft of spiritual meaning. Yeah. And when you listen to the traditional compositions, yeah. you feel a connection which is visceral, which yeah. is very, very instinctive yeah. and simply can't be described. Yeah. So it was just a powerful, powerful vehicle that they used yeah. to convey their message. Yeah. And this is how Guru Nanak used to engage his audience. Yeah. You know, he would go from village to village. His companion Mardana would be with him carrying his rabab. Yes. Yes. So Guru Nanak would go to the center of the village. Usually there would be a big tree. Yep. Of course, this was before Netflix. So people <laughs> didn't have much to do in the evening. So True. Guru Nanak would sit down. He yep. would tell Mardana to start strumming his rabab. Yep. And then he would start singing. Yeah. And in a few minutes, a few urchins would gather around them because the kids are the ones who always show up first. Right. And then their parents would show up. They would right. sit. 
Yeah. They would listen and yeah. then they would talk. Mm -hmm. So this singing is an unbroken tradition that goes all the way back to Guru Nanak right. and the rag based melodies were the basis. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the publisher. I mean, uh, you know, uh, for a book like this, uh, of course, first of all, the cover is amazing. Uh, I want you to talk about the cover also because uh, you know, it's not a usual book cover. It's uh, it depicts something. So that's important. And of course, the publisher, how did it happen? Because, you know, a book like this, it's, I mean, don't be worried, uh, book lovers. Uh, it's a thick one, but you know, you, you need to kind of read it slowly. You know, you don't have to, you know, go through it. You know, you have to take time and it'll take time. I mean, I took my time for this one. So take your time, pick this up, but tell us about the publishing process a little bit because, uh, sure. you know, it sure. must be, it's tough to kind of, you know, get, get this kind of book green lighted. Sure. So, you know, I, uh, my journey as a writer has a lot of serendipity in it and a lot of mild posts in it. Yeah. in the form of some very lovely and generous individuals. Yeah. So writing is my second career, so to speak. You know, yeah. I am an engineer by training and most of my life I have spent doing, you know, developing technology, then managing technology and managing technology businesses oh, while I always had a passion for writing. Yeah. So to give you the short version, uh, Several years ago, um, driven by mostly a desire to eventually create a very compelling TV series yeah. about the life and times of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, yeah. I started doing research. And, you know, I started capturing my research into the form of uh, uh, long nonfiction pieces. And, you know, I started sharing them on the web with people and so on yeah. and so forth. And one of my friends who was at that time just a Facebook friend yeah. uh, is uh, a writer uh, based in Bangalore and a journalist. His name is Amandeep Sandhu. Okay. You may have come across some of his oh, writings. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, Amandeep and I chatted and Amandeep yeah. said, you know what? The stuff that you're writing is pretty decent. You know, you should, first of all, not just put it all out there on the web, you know, you should get it published. Yeah. And I said, well, why don't you introduce me to people in the publishing business? And you know, a lot of people who are successful are so ungenerous. You know, <laughs> I, I say this sadly, Amandeep is cut from very different cloth. Oh my you know, his immediate response was, well, I know a couple of people. I, I know this great editor at Westland Books. Uh, you know, why don't I connect you with him? So mm -hmm. he introduced me to um, uh, Karthik Venkatesh, who's an editor at Westland. Yeah. yeah. Lovely, lovely individual who has, you know, since become a very good friend. Okay. Uh, very much connected to Punjab and Punjabi and Punjabiat. Yeah. So, um, you know, I sent the manuscript over to him. And he said, we love it and okay. we're going to publish it. Yeah. So that's how the Camel Merchant of Philadelphia was published. Yeah. Now, uh, a lot of things happen serendipitously. Yeah. So when the Camel Merchant of Philadelphia came out, one of the copies went to the writer Anchal Malhotra, who I'm sure you know as well. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. So Anchal had the very nice museum? things. museum? Uh, is she the one? Uh... Uh, yeah, uh, she wrote that beautiful book about uh, partition, uh, yeah, remnants of a separation. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Indeed. So Anchal had very nice things to say about uh, the book. And, you know, she eventually participated in uh, one of the events that we had in Delhi. Okay. And, you know, I was talking to Anchal about my writing journey moving forward. You know, I had, uh, I was working on something at that time, the night of the, what became the night of the rest of spirits. Yeah. And I said, you know, maybe I should get an agent. And Anchal, you know, uh, who I'd connected with by then uh, said, well, uh, my dad runs a, a agency and he's pretty well connected. Why don't you talk to him? Yeah. So that's how I was connected to my literary agent, uh, uh, Red Ink. 
Right. And all credit to them for mm-hmm. placing both Night of the Restless Spirits and the story of the six with Penguin. Yeah, very good. Uh, very good. <laughs> yeah, they did an excellent job. Yeah. And then, you know, I I had a great experience at Westland Books as well. I mean, you know, it's a wonderful publisher. They did a brilliant job in my book. Yeah. And, you know, they're, they continue to be my friends. Yeah. And I have had an equally wonderful relationship with Penguin. Yeah. Uh, they really are believers in my work. Um, I worked closely with a very young designer at Penguin on the covers of both books. Yeah. I was very nitpicky and very finicky. <laughs> and I can, know, she, I can see that. I can see that. She exceeded my expectations. Yeah. So really, my entire experience dealing with Penguin has yeah. been stellar going you know all the way from my lovely editor to the publisher yeah. i just wanted to show everyone job. something that there is a sort of scripture here and i uh, pardon me i don't recognize what it is but is it good sure sure uh, so this so the cover illustration yeah. Yeah. is from a folio illustrated folio in the dasam granth which okay. there's a whole chapter dedicated to the dasam granth okay. so it's important to understand that dasam granth is not six scripture okay the dasam granth is a mishmash of writings yeah. uh, which contain uh, some writings that are accepted to be unequivocally written by guru gobind singh yeah. and are very much the part of sikh spiritual practice case in point the job sav the savaye mm-hmm. the chapai which are mm-hmm. recited by six on a daily basis right. then there are lots of epics that were translated uh, you know from uh, uh, you know uh, the uh, from the puranas and other sources translated to braj bhasha so that common people could read them and be inspired yeah. there are other sections which are a collection of stories literature of the time taken from many many different sources yeah. so the title uh, the cover shows a illustrated folio from the dasam granth mm. and the text that you see i'll just read a little bit tribhaman mahi pasur nar asur net net ban trin kahat uh, so this is uh, uh, these are writings from the job side of Guru okay. Gobind Singh okay. and uh, I chose this particular graphic because this is just absolutely beautiful the graphic is wonderful is. and uh, my designer at Penguin did such a brilliant job incorporating into the cover I shall be eternally grateful to her Oh goodness gracious I have so many questions but okay uh, we have limited time of course uh, yes. guys you have to read the book uh, leave a review on amazon uh, and sir is available to talk to on facebook and instagram you can send him a message sure i'm very easy to find and i'm very accessible yeah. i'm i'm not one of those writers who's <laughs> aspiring to be the next jd salinger i'll tell you that i'm easy to find and if you want to really get into this and you know know more about uh, the religion and it's it's an experience i i am i must be honest uh, and uh, go to the podcast by the same name so i'm not wrong right it's by the same name the story of the six yes. right yeah so go to the podcast it is it on uh, spotify it's everywhere it's, it's everywhere on spotify right? it's an apple podcast stitcher yeah. google play you know everywhere that people find podcasts yeah. you will find the story of the six so go listen to the podcast read the book and then you know kind of you can shoot your questions to uh, sir uh, online and we are looking forward to many more books from you i mean this was truly educating and i don't say it often uh, <laughs> reading a lot of books over a period of time but uh, you know um some are just to you know kind of entertain myself uh, i do that but hey, <laughs> nothing one... wrong with that i i read a lot of stuff my reading list uh, in the back somewhere you probably see my guilty pleasures uh, shelf which has john le car it has yeah. the game of thrones yeah. books uh, george r r martin oh wow so nothing nothing wrong with being entertained by <laughs> books <laughs> so, so we should end with some couple of recommendations from you you know we should end with that because this is the book nerds and you know we love to read books so just couple of recommendations which you have might have on your shelf recently oh sure sure so um uh 
you know, I read a lot of fiction and nonfiction, but, uh, you know, novels are kind of my first love, to be very honest with you. Wonderful. So one set of books that I would point my listeners to would be Hilary Mantel's books about uh, Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn and Thomas Cromwell. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you know, uh, the first two books in her series both got bookers, which is unheard of. I'm talking about Wolf Hall and Bring Up the Bodies. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if somebody wants to learn how to write historical fiction, yeah. they should read these books. These okay. are so amazing. Yeah. So I would definitely recommend these among the best works of fiction that uh, mm -hmm. I've uh, read recently. Wonderful. So thank you so much, sir. It has been a wonderful time talking to you. Love the book. Looking forward to so much more and listening to the podcast regularly. It is on my list now because I have, you know, kind of subscribed to you. I'll do that. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. So uh, I'll share something else with you. I'm yeah, coming sure. up with a new podcast, which you'll probably oh. find interesting. Oh wow! So this podcast is going to be focused on uh, Indian writing or writing from the Indian subcontinent yeah. and uh, the very first episode features uh, Rajat Ubhayakar's Truck De India okay. which is, uh, I don't know if you've read that book or not but that's another book that I can okay. recommend without reservations okay. it's such a delightful book to read Truck okay. De India Okay, <laughs> wonderful so yeah I mean thank you so much uh, for sparing time and uh, have a great time and uh, until next time, uh, uh, all the book lovers, all the book nerds, you can, for other literary content, you can always, you know, uh, subscribe to us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. And uh, until next time, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It was such a pleasure <laughs> and I really enjoyed the discussion. Thank you. Thank you.